please? Oh, 8 o'clock patients. Okay. All right. Uh, so welcome everybody and happy holidays. We wanted to do something that hopefully will be fun and um, encourage everybody to actively participate and also to reflect on um, the wealth of resources and expertise that we have available to us as uh, clinicians practicing um, in our environment here at Children's. I think, uh, speaking for myself, sometimes I take for granted all of the expertise that I have available to me in helping to care for uh, sick and injured kids here at Children's. And so what we'd like to do is to reflect at this time of the year, uh, I think everyone thinks more about children and their welfare than we do at other times of the year. And so just to reflect on children who don't have the luxury of being cared for in such a rich environment, those children who may come from a part of the world where the environment is not as uh, wealthy. And so we're going to present a diagnostic unknown from another part of the world and ask you to think about the differential diagnosis. We don't have a lot of fancy diagnostic tests, but we'd like you to think about your, what your approach to this patient would be. And then we have a panel of our experts that we're going to ask up to give their opinion about how they would assess and manage this patient. I would like to introduce our presenter of the case, Dr. Daniel DeSalvo, who is our pediatric chief resident here at Children's National and board certified pediatrician as of this week. <laughs> born and raised in Texas, where he attended Baylor University and Texas A&M College of Medicine. He is graduate of their community health track at Children's National, where he pursued his interest in health policy, advocacy, and global health. He has served on medical missions trips to Mexico, Thailand, Rwanda, and Haiti just a couple of weeks after the earthquake. Dr. DeSalvo is an active researcher in diabetes, endocrinology, and medical education, and has been awarded the 2012 ACGME David C. Leach Award for fostering innovating educational outcomes. Dr. DeSalvo and his mentor, Dr. Fran Cohen, developed an educational quality improvement project that resulted in greater than 50% reduction in resident-related diabetes errors. After his chief residence, residency here at Children's National, Dr. DeSalvo will start his pediatric endocrinology fellowship. He's actually leaving us and going to Lucille Packard Children's Hospital at Stanford. And very exciting news, Dan is especially excited that he and his wife, Michelle, are expecting their first child in March. <laughs> Thanks, Elena, for the introduction, and welcome, everyone, to a very special Holiday Grand Rounds. Let's go and get started with our case. So the case involves an eight-year-old boy who was seen by pediatricians on a medical mission trip to a developing nation. He lives with his family of eight in a very overcrowded situation. It's very heavily polluted, and it's in an urban setting. So I must say that when Dr. Adelini asked me to do this, I jumped at the bit. You know, I've done prof rounds several times, put cases together, but this is a, a resource scarce area and the documentation was also kind of scant so I did my very best job of putting this together so bear with me as we present this case. So the child, this eight-year-old boy, according to his parents, suffers from an unknown medical condition. He has a very, he's been very small for as long as the family can remember. He has a severe asymmetric limp and he wears leg braces at the request of his pediatrician. His parents note that the patient has a progressive weakness of intermittent or fluctuating character and his family has been told by the pediatrician that this illness is likely terminal. In fact, the pediatrician thinks that the child has less than a year to live. So in terms of his past medical history, he has proportional short stature, his height is less than the third standard deviation, and his head circumference is proportionally small. He has no past hospitalizations, no history of surgery before. He doesn't take any medication on a regular basis and his immunization status is actually unknown by the family. As far as the family history, the parents are described as being healthy, but unfortunately we don't know what their, their parental heights are. As a future endocrinologist, I would have loved to have calculated a mid-parental height, but that information is not available. His siblings are described as healthy with normal stature and development. In terms of his social history, he's described as having normal intelligence, this young boy is, but unfortunately due to his illness for the last several months, He's been unable to attend school. 
He lives in what's described as a very small house with his mother and father and five siblings, so eight total people in the family. Uh, he has two brothers, ages 5 and 14. His three sisters are 6, 10, and 12 years old. Again, the living conditions are described as overcrowded with filthy streets. And just outside, there's an open sewer with industrial chemicals flowing through it. And his father is employed as a clerk, but unfortunately, he's received no wages for quite some time now. On review of systems for this child, he's described as having a decreased energy level. He denies any eye problems. For ENT, he has nasal congestion and some rhinorrhea, but denies sore throat. Respiratory-wise, he has a mild cough, but no wheezing, no shortness of breath. For GI, he denies nausea, vomiting, or diarrhea. GU, there's no dysuria, no gross hematuria. For musculoskeletal, there's just this asymmetric limp, which is not very well described. For hemoc, there's no bruising, no petechiae. Uh, Neuro-wise, he has this intermittent weakness of progressive nature, and all other systems are presumed to be negative for this patient. On physical exam, his vital signs are within normal limits. He is noted to be quite short with a height less than the fifth percentile. His weight's also less than the fifth percentile, so a very small child. Generally, he's noted to be very pale and quite sickly appearing. For HENT, um, he does have some rhinorrhea that's noted and also some poor dentition, but otherwise negative. CV-wise, he has regular rate and rhythm. Respiratory-wise, lungs are clear bilaterally. GI-wise, his abdomen is soft and non-tender. And musculoskeletal, again, just this asymmetric limp. He's also described as having a withered little hand. From a neuro standpoint, he's alert and oriented with a normal mental status. His cranial nerves are intact. He has this lower extremity weakness, but it's really not described in the documentation. It's unknown if there's any focality to his exam. Um, and his reflexes aren't documented. And there's really, there, there's no abnormal movement. So this is as much as we can really gather from his physical exam. So in summary, we have an eight-year-old boy who's living in destitute conditions. He's suffering from an unknown illness that involves short stature, intermittent progressive weakness, and an asymmetric limp. And there's concern for terminal illness. This child has been told by his pediatrician that he has less than a year to live. So we thought that since we have everyone gathered here to, together for this special holiday grand rounds, we actually break into small groups and with the folks right around you, just discuss for a second what you think could possibly be going on with this poor child. So just break into small groups with the folks around you and discuss for a couple minutes what could be going on with this child. What is a differential diagnosis? We'll give you about two or three minutes and then ask for members of the audience to, to, to give us your thoughts on a microphone before we invite our distinguished panel for it. So. Let's group up. Hello. Okay. So now that we had a, a moment to sort of pontificate over this patient and try to decide what could be going on with him, I'd like to ask the audience what you're thinking. So if, if someone could raise their hand and talk to us a little bit about what you think could be going on with this poor child. <laughs> 
Uh, from years of long experience, I have no idea. <laughs> uh, we, we kicked around a lot of things. Among the, the things that were missing is something about the child's prenatal and natal history, which might or might not be of some use, but uh, uh, does he have some uh, congenital defect of some sort? Has he picked up some kind of a bug that why has it affected the other kids in the family? Uh, so those are among our, our worries and concerns. That's a, a very excellent point. Unfortunately, in the, in the documentation, there's no description of the patient's birth history um, or any of the things you mentioned. So it does make this quite a, a diagnostic dilemma, certainly. Any other thoughts from the audience? We thought, we, thought about birth, we thought about birth as well. The, the part that puzzled us is that it's progressive. And if it's at birth, we would have thought that that wouldn't have been uh, progression. So we, you know, talked about congenital. Or not, we talked about a possible bleed in the head. And, but uh, based on the progression, we we kind of thought it might be a lot more likely either infectious or metabolic or enzyme or something. And then we talked about uh, the pollution. And within, so we kind of thought that was a red herring because there's six, seven other kids. Uh, you would assume that they all play around in the same area. So so we didn't. We did, we, so we're kind of thinking more in fact it's something that has a progression in nature uh, infectious metabolic uh, that that kind excellent thoughts any final thoughts from other audience members maybe from the residents perhaps so dr. Himmler mentioned that it could be rickets good thought a anyone else any other thoughts So Dr. Cheney has interesting thoughts. So, so let's, let's, let's skip that one for now. Let's skip that one for now. So the question is, what illness do you think this patient could possibly have? Let me hand you the mic so the folks who are listening at home can also listen. Uh, we were thinking mostly metabolic or maybe mitochondrial disorders or POTS. Also POTS. So excellent discussions. And it just so happens that we have archive video footage of this patient that we'd like to show you at this time. So if we could cue it in the back, we actually have video footage of this patient. So there was actually a gentleman in the, in the front row here, Dr. Newman actually, who said, I knew that was Tiny Tim. He actually mentioned to his group that that was Tiny Tim the whole time. I think there were a few people in the back who knew. Right. And they laughed. So go figure. That's not a diagnosis. So Tiny Tim is a fictional character in the novel A Christmas Girl by Charles Dickens. And Tiny Tim was the son of Bob Cratchit, who was an unpaid clerk who worked for Ebenezer Scrooge. When the ghost of Christmas present came to visit Ebenezer Scrooge, he saw that Tiny Tim was indeed very, very ill, um, in fact, dying. And uh, when the ghost of Christmas present visited Ebenezer Scrooge, he saw that all that was left was just a crutch, that in fact, Tiny Tim had died. And this, of course, caused Ebenezer Scrooge to change his, his miserly, his miserly ways, and he started contributing the funds to the family. And Tiny Tim received the treatment he needed and actually went on to live, we think, a happy, productive life. So what was it that was ailing Tiny Tim? It's an age-old question. And we actually have a very esteemed group of panelists. I'd like to welcome forward at this time, including Dr. Dibiasi from Infectious Disease, Dr. Nanda Gopal from Endocrinology, Dr. Summer from Genetics and Metabolism, who's going to talk about possible metabolic causes of, of the, the, the um, sickness for Tiny Tim. Dr. Lanthner is going to cover dysmorphology. Dr. Scafidi from Neurology is going to talk about, could this have been a neurologic defect for Tiny Tim? So the question that was posed to this panel, 
is what was Ailing Tiny Tim? So if you could come forward at this time, please. So first, we can have Dr. DiBiase talk from an ID standpoint. Of course, infection should always be first. So particularly in this kid, um, then, back then, as in now, we want to think of common things first. So um, the things that would be highest on my list from an uh, infectious standpoint would be POTS disease of the spine. Um, polio, actually, would, might fit the clinical syndrome a little bit better, and I'll say a couple things about that. And then probably further down on the list would be something like congenital infections, such as syphilis, which could lead to long-term neurologic complications. Um, if you just looked at his SGA and being, you know, small and mal, you could say, well, maybe he's just malnourished. Um, but it's really hard to put together his SGA with this neurologic limping or musculoskeletal complaint that seems to be asymmetric and also the fact that it's progressive. So let's just go in, in order quickly of those three things. So for POTS disease of the spine, for those of you that aren't as familiar with that, usually it's from a hematogenous spread or a direct extension from a pulmonary focus, but you may not have pulmonary disease at the time that you have POTS. It could have been a hematogenous spread. And usually it'll involve a couple of vertebrae that are adjacent, and then when those vertebrae extend into the disc space, um, there's there can be collapse of the spine. So sometimes they'll be kyphotic, and I didn't notice that in, in his case. Um, but when you have compression, you can actually have involvement of the spinal cord and therefore have these neurologic symptoms. Asymmetric would be a little bit less common than bilaterally symmetric, you know, if you've got compression um, of the spine. But, you know, TB is very common and was common back then. So I think that's definitely the differential. And to work that up, you could do a PPD. Uh, I don't know if they had a PPD back then, but uh, if they had a uh, chest rent grins, I suppose you could do that. Uh, but, you know, now certainly we would do a chest x-ray and we would do uh, plain films of the spine initially. Um, and then if he had abnormalities on chest x-ray or lung findings, you could do a sputum uh, looking for the germ itself. For polio, I think there's actually a lot more clinically that would fit with polio. Um, and also TB would be a fatal terminal illness. Um, but against it would be, unless there was a Christmas miracle, there was no treatment back then for TB. So you, it probably would not reverse after a year. Um, for polio, the, the pathophysiology of that is it is a viral infection as opposed to bacterial. It's, it would be common because it's fecal orally spread and they're in this you know environment where they've got all this sewage going through the street, etc. And uh, initially you'd have inflammation of the anterior uh, horn cells in the spinal cord and about half of the patients just get better. So I guess if he was early in his illness, that maybe he would have this fluctuating and maybe slightly progressive weakness. But in general, for spinal uh, polio, it's not a fatal illness. So, you know, unless the physician was confused, uh, you know, polio is generally not fatal, unless you have the bulbar form where you have respiratory involvement, which he didn't seem to have. Um, but the asymmetric nature would work. It can be more than one level, so that would fit better than TB, where you had this withered hand, which the way you'd explain that is he had the death of the anterior motor horn cell, and now he's not uh, innervating that part of the muscle, and then it, it uh, degenerated. So that might fit. Um, probably the best of any of those things. And then for congenital syphilis, again, it would be nice to know the prenatal history. It would be pretty... I think unusual to have this severe tertiary progressive syphilis and be completely intellectually normal. So I think that's pretty unlikely. Um, and then I think that's it. That's my top three. I'd go with, if it if it was an infection, I'd go with polio. But I I don't think it's an infection. That's my which I rarely say. But he's so obstinately optimistic that. I'm skeptical of his intellectual normalcy. Okay. So, <laughs> given Dickensian England, it's not okay to be that optimistic. Well, wonderful. Very interesting discussion. So, Dr. Nanagopal from Metacronology is going to speak now at this point, if you'd like to.
I also forgot to say I would do a CS if I would do a spinal tap. Look at his CSF. See if he had cells or lymphocytic pleocytosis. That All the needles polio. are rusty. Wow. <laughs> You'll get uh, tetanus from that. <laughs> Better tetanus. So Dan gave me the opportunity to put in some slides, so I did. Um, and I have to say, we're so lucky that Dan is coming over to really what I think is the best specialty. So he made a great choice. Um, so I think from an endocrine perspective, there's a lot that we can explain about Tiny Tim. And um, sorry. From an endocrine perspective, there's a lot we can explain about Tiny, Tiny Tim, but there are some things that don't really fit. But I think, as with most things, hormones do end up being the final common pathway. So I thought we'd talk about um, vitamin D just briefly. Those of you who were at Prof Rounds last week saw this um, slide, so I'm getting a bit of overexposure. But um, sunlight generally allows us to produce vitamin D. Um, that we can actually use in our body. And then we hydroxylate vitamin D in the liver, and then we hydroxylate it again in the kidney, and that's what allows us to absorb calcium. So we generally get it from our diet, but usually, and especially in um, Tiny Tim's time, there's no way he was getting fortified dairy products. So all of his vitamin D would have had to come from the sun. And he also could have had mutations in any step of this pathway, which would have not allowed him to use vitamin D properly or might have caused him to waste phosphate, giving him a phosphate-wasting vitamin D uh, type of rickets. And that would help us to explain why he alone among his peers and his um, siblings, who are all being exposed to the same levels of pollution and all being exposed to the same levels of sunlight or lack thereof, um, he alone is really manifesting all these symptoms. So really, you could have a block in sunlight, not getting enough, putting on sunscreen as we do nowadays, um, not hydroxylating your vitamin D properly, not um, one alpha hydroxylating it properly so you don't get resorption from the bone, um, or problems with bony resistance to um, parathyroid hormones. So that would be something like um, pseudo-hypoparathyroidism, but he doesn't appear to have any of the other features of Albright's hereditary osteodystrophy. So just a word about UV rays and pollution, because this is something, if you end up reading the articles about Tiny, Tiny Tim, a lot of people sort of bat around this idea of what could pollution have done to Tiny Tim. Um, so it's really important to have UVA rays. Um, uh, UVA rays are really important in developing things like malignant melanoma, basal cell carcinoma, sort of these bad diseases we think of from the sun. But UVB rays actually promote the production of the vitamin D that we can actually use in our skin. And what we know about pollution is it actually reduces UV radiation, but it sort of preferentially reduces UVB radiation. So it's possible that with less exposure to the outside world, especially if this is a little kid with a chronic disease who's kept inside a lot of the time covered up, that he's really, when he does go out, he's only exposed to this polluted air, and he's really getting almost no conversion to vitamin D. Um, so then. The final thing I just wanted to mention is if we actually had radiograms, <laughs> radiographs, we might see this kind of um, appearance on Tiny Tim's x-ray where he has leg bowing um, and cupping and fraying at the metaphyses. Um, and you can see that here as well. Um, and very, very osteopenic limbs. And this idea of, well, rickets doesn't necessarily explain an asymmetric limp. You actually can see this, and we still see this, unfortunately, in developing countries today. There's something called the windswept deformity, where you actually get a genuvalgum on one side and a genuvarus on the other side, and you have a severe asymmetric limp. So that's certainly possible, and those of us who've been to developing countries or have, um, have grown up in them have certainly seen this. Other things we might see on his physical exam, obviously not the physical exam of the actor who portrays him, um, <laughs> might be the Harrison sulcus, which is this um, sort of horizontal line at the diaphragm, or uh, rachitic rosary. So these are all other things that we could have looked for. So I don't think rickets explains everything about Tiny Tim, but certainly a little cod liver oil wouldn't hurt him, a little fresh mountain air. And certainly that could probably reverse some of the issues that he's facing. Had they let this go, could it have been fatal? Probably not if it was just rickets, although hypophosphatemic rickets can, with electrolyte abnormalities, certainly be progressive and fatal. Um, hypocalcemia from rickets can certainly cause seizures, so it's possible that that would have been sort of an unpredicted way to die for Tiny Tim, but a little fresh mountain air, a little um, cod liver oil, and probably we could have nursed him back to health. Thank you very much. The discussion could not have been complete without an endocrinologist. <laughs> uh, next, I'd like to invite Dr. Summer to talk about whether or not this could have been a metabolic disorder.
Now, Chris, this is actually uh, one of Norman Rockwell's early sketches on Tiny Tim. As you can see, he's not tremendously dysmorphic, so I have to agree with the ladies over there who think metabolic disease is definitely something to look at. And of course, since geneticists have unlimited amounts of time on our hands, we were able to obtain some additional history. <laughs> uh, <laughs> most of this is from third person observation. Alas, for Tiny Tim, he bore a little crutch. So just one crutch, so it was asymmetric, and had his limbs supported by an iron frame, which would actually would have been somewhat unusual at that time. That implies he had access to fairly good medical care back at that point in time. Um, but the other thing is he was not neurologically normal. His sister described him as somehow he gets thoughtful sitting by himself so much and thinks the strangest things you ever heard. So perhaps having delusions, um, having some type of uh, hallucinations, things like that. So Tiny Tim was actually not. Another thing to remember though is Dickens based almost all of his characters on actual historical figures. The other thing to remember is Dickens grew up in Camden, London. His father was in the poorhouse. His family actually spent a fair amount of time in debtor's prison as a result of that. Uh, London at that time was not a nice place. And I'll actually give you a little more history on that later on. And of course, there's also some echolalia. So when the family <laughs> says a Merry Christmas to us all, my dears, God bless us. God bless us, everyone, said Tiny Tim, the last of all. So a little bit of lag in processing signals. And then some echolalia. Um, he had a plaintive little voice. So one would have to think perhaps some pulmonary insufficiency, <laughs> some weakness, that sort of thing. And of course, his father, trying to make you know light of things as fathers will often do, said he was growing strong and hardy. And of course, we know this is contradictory. He was getting weaker and weaker. And whatever he had was going to be lethal within a year. And we also know from our historical documents that it was curable, because when Scrooge did reform, it said that Tiny Tib lived a full and healthy life. So that's why we need to look to metabolism for these things. So some additional history. We actually know the historical character Tiny Tim was based on was born September 25th, 1839. So that gives us a historical context for what was going on in both the infectious disease world as well as the world of nutrition and metabolism. His address would have actually been 16 Bayham Street, Camden, London, the house that Charles Dickens grew up in in Camden. Um, we do have some family history. This is actually a plate from the original illustration from the first uh, edition of uh, Christmas Carol. And as you can see, that's his father, Bob Cratchit, there. You'll notice he's got a bit of a scooped out nose. He had short stature, too. He was known as Little Bob. So obviously, Dr. Lamfer is going to definitely approach some of the dysmorphology issues of this. <laughs> a little bit of kyphoscoliosis, you might note as well. So we certainly can't rule out a genetic cause here, an autosomal dominant, perhaps, something like that. Uh, he had three siblings reported healthy. So also recessive certainly could be a part of that. You know, if you've got three healthy and one affected child, you know, that would certainly be the odds for an autosomal recessive. And we know cold intolerance. We know Bob Cratchit was always going to the coal bin for an extra piece of coal. His employer had to chastise him about this numerous times. So we actually have to throw <laughs> that into our differential diagnosis. Um, the past medical history, a deformed back, crippled from birth. Uh, potential death was around age nine. And I'll tell you a little bit more about that. And then, of course, his withered hand. So metabolic differential. Obviously, we don't have a newborn screen card on this child to work from, but we can make some suppositions. We do know his intellect was normal. He was able to read. Uh, and actually, the actual historical character was able to read as well. So probably not PKU, probably not maple syrup urine disease. You know, I didn't describe that along with the Christmas wreath odor that there was also pancakes in the house. Um, homocystinuria, he had short stature, not tall stature. Uh, a urea cycle defect, I wish. We love urea cycle defects here. Um, a peroxisomal disorder, his IQ was too normal for that. Uh, and a storage disorder, well, he lives and is healthy. If he'd had a lysosomal storage disorder, it really wouldn't have mattered how good Scrooge became. Tiny Tim wouldn't have made it. Uh, some other things to consider, though, in the metabolic field, a carnitine transport defect certainly would be a possibility. With a poor nutritional diet, no good source of meat, um, that could lead to weakness that could be progressive but typically doesn't give you skeletal problems, so that one doesn't work too well. And a mitochondrial defect, obviously, as the group was thinking over there. Uh, we all love mitochondrial defects because once you've diagnosed them, you can almost never undiagnose them. Um, but it doesn't typically give you a skeletal presentation with an asymmetric requirement for a crutch and a back problem or a withered hand. It'd just be more generalized weakness. So here are some metabolic conditions though, that I think we should consider. Pellegra. Pellegra was actually rampant in London at that time. Corn had been introduced from the colonies, and a consistent diet of only corn will not make you niacin deficient. Interestingly enough, corn has niacin in it, but unless you soak it in lime, 
which the American Indians did, you don't actually get the niacin out of it. So Pellegra will give you mental confusion and difficulty. Tiny Tim was a strange child who's had hallucinations. Osteoporosis <laughs> with chronic disease. It is deadly. A lot of folks died from this. In fact, up into the 19, about 1914 in the U.S., this was a common cause of death in children in the United States. Uh, and it's associated with an all-corn diet. And we know that they had, the Cratchits were poor. They didn't have a lot of food. So it's quite possible that they had a very common, consistent diet of corn because it was cheap. Another one that I think actually is a very strong contender here is scurvy. Scurvy was still rampant in London at those times. Not everyone had access to citrus fruit. It wasn't completely known what the active ingredient was there. You would certainly get skeletal and joint uh, changes, which could be quite severe. You get dental changes. We've already had described in his uh, preliminary that he had uh, bad teeth, weakness, and it is deadly. Killed literally millions of sailors and also millions of civilians and was easily treated. So perhaps if Scrooge intervened and gave Tiny Tim a healthy diet, uh, you know, brought him out, uh, you know, fed him more, that would have certainly cured it. It would have cured it pretty quickly. Uh, rickets, of course, we keep talking about again and again. Um, vitamin D uh, availability or um, basically <laughs> some type of defect in transport or processing. Uh, London in the 1800s had a city sky. In fact, in 1843, it was really, really nasty. You could almost not see the sun at all. There was very poor diet with little calcium, vitamin D, or magnesium, and almost everyone's died at that point in time. Poor bone growth, um, bone pain, and weakness are all parts of that. It's not typically deadly, though. Not that many deaths from that. You treat it with cod liver oil or with UV light. This is a picture from back in the early 1900s of small toddlers getting their vitamin D treatments with their um, nuclear explosion type sunglasses on. Uh, iatrogenic. The other thing to consider, though, Tiny Tim did have a metal brace on. He had access to physicians. Physicians were probably one of the greatest causes of death in London in the 1840s. Um, most of the cure-alls of those days contained both alcohol and opiates. Perhaps Tiny Tim was being drugged into oblivion. A lot of them also contained mercury and other heavy metals. We also know that there was an industrial toxin site immediately outside. So it's quite possibly he was also being killed by uh, patent medicines. And it's quite possible that when Scrooge took over, Scrooge we know believed in dietary cures for diseases. He was treating himself with gruel for his respiratory infection, actually in uh, one of the earlier parts of that. So I think certainly that's a possibility. This is just shows what happens for admissions for scurvy. Our time point is about 1843, so scurvy was still quite common uh, in London at that time. Uh, the other thing to remember is cholera as an infectious disease, which would affect absorption of nutrients, which could have complicated Tiny Tim's case. In the 1840s, cholera was rampant. This was a etching from London at that time. As you can see, these guys etched in as gray. Uh, this is uh, from Ricketts. There weren't that many deaths from Ricketts. Thanks. Um, this is actually data from the 1600s through 1757. As you can see, the death rate from Ricketts had actually decreased quite a bit by the 1800s. I think Ricketts may be less likely. I tend to lean towards scurvy or pellagra myself as easily treatable conditions. This is the historic basis for Tiny Tim. This is actually Charles Dickens' nephew by his sister, his older sister, Fanny uh, Dickens Burnett. This, she's actually the character who was the sister who brought him home from school early in that. She also is the basis for several others. Uh, Harry Burnett was the basis for Tiny Tim and several others. He was born with a spinal abnormality. This is the only photograph I could find on him. Dr. Lamford may wish to comment upon some of his facial appearance, except for the large ear right there. Uh, and he died um, September, excuse me, January 29th, 1849, about a year after his mother passed away, who was described as a frail individual who is consumptive, so we also have to keep TB in our differential as well. And so what would have happened if Tiny Tim had lived? <laughs> well, we know. <laughs> he became a popular music star back in the 60s and 70s after being in cold storage for many, many years. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much for that enlightening and entertaining perspective on Tiny Tim. So Dr. Lamford now at this time he's going to talk about Tiny Tim from a genetics perspective. Uh, so I was asked to think about what kind of dysmorphic or genetic syndrome Tiny Tim might have had. Um, let's see. Now the problem we have dealing with this question is that we don't have a very clear phenotype. Dickens wrote a pretty mean line of prose but he wasn't much of a dysmorphologist. In the whole book, he doesn't mention Palmer priest patterns or people at a distance <laughs> or anything like that. So it's really, he didn't do us a lot of favors. So I actually spent a lot of time on Google Images and had a blast doing that. And 
have a couple of different pictures or representations of Tiny Tim that we can work from looking for uh, dysmorphisms and clues about what might be going on with him. It's all part of our new telemedicine program. That's right. right. <laughs> yeah. So the text doesn't really describe him particularly well. It says he's small, says he's inordinately happy, which seems unusual uh, <laughs> given what we know about London in the 1840s. He's also asymmetric, and he's got a, one side bigger than the other. And so this raises possibilities, in my mind, of Russell Silver syndrome. Those kids are typically born very small. They have reasonably preserved intellect, and they have some degree of hemihypertrophy, so one side of their body is bigger than the other. They're not usually lethal or have any kind of major health complications, but it's, you know, at least the description of his appearance uh, raised that possibility for me. Looking at various film and TV versions, this is a picture from a 1984 film of, uh, of A Christmas Carol. This kid looks kind of small and puny and malnourished, but what stands out to me are this kind of pinched mid-face, plus poor dentition. He's got these small, pointy, kind of unusually colored teeth. Um, we know he has lymph and limb anomalies. So I was wondering, could he have some kind of uh, genetic bone disorder? Osteogenesis imperfective could lead to uh, dentinogenesis imperfective, so problematic teeth plus frequent fractures, which may not heal well, which would require bracing and limping. Um, and, and, and so that's a possibility for him. Moving on, I found this picture from a 1971 TV cartoon. <laughs> this kid does not look normal to me. <laughs> He's clearly hypertelluric. He's got this big flat nasal bridge, kind of a puny nose. He's highly arched eyebrows. He's small. This pattern looks to me like Robinow syndrome. So Robinow is a skeletal dysplasia that can have congenital scoliosis. <coughs> uh, they can have all kinds of vertebral defects. They have this very, um, they're described in the literature as having kind of a fetal appearance to their face. I think you can kind of see that in that face. Um, he also has a really thin upper lip, so I wonder about fetal alcohol syndrome. You hear a lot more about Bob Cratchit than <laughs> Tiny Tim's mom, so you wonder if she was drunk in a corner or something. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> This is another cartoon I found of uh, Tiny Tim. This kid got what looks like relative macrocephaly. <laughs> Very hypertelluric again. I think it's something about all cartoons are hypertelluric, but this kid particularly has this very scooped out nasal bridge, very flat nasal bridge with kind of an upturned nose. Uh, doesn't appear to have nostrils. Um, <laughs> very dysplastic ears, simplified ears, um, disconjugate gaze. Uh, motor delays, wearing, you know, using a crutch. This kid, to me, looks like he's got 156 microdeletion syndrome. We could only get a microarray in 1840s England. We could have a lot of answers. A more recent version, uh, or no, I found this doll. This doll is all over the internet. I, I don't know who buys it, but it's supposed to be Tiny Tim. This kid's very hypertelluric. He's got these up slanting palpable fissures. You make a line between his camp eye. You can see these very slanted palpable fissures. This very short upturned nose, again. Um, very long philtrum. Very wide mouth. Unusual appearing teeth that are a lot of space between the teeth. Um, he's quite microcephalic appearing. Very happy, unusually happy. This, to me, makes me think of Williams syndrome. This kid looks exactly like patients I've seen with Williams syndrome. So I think Williams syndrome is a real possibility. Those kids are small. They are freakishly happy, at least as toddlers and, and young children. So that could fit uh, with Tiny Tim's demeanor. And then there's the Muppets. The Muppets <laughs> have done a couple of different uh, Christmas carols. This is Robin. This is Kermit's cousin or nephew or something. And if you look at him, he's got significant proptosis. <laughs> He's got a very long protuberant nose. It's remarkably microcephalic. I think that's mostly hat. There's probably not much head underneath there. <laughs> Again, a poorly formed nasal bridge. That seems to be a theme in, in a lot of these depictions of Tiny Tim. Uh, not a lot of definition to his filtrum. Uh, no dentition. Webbed feet and hands. No hair. No sweating, at least if he's still an amphibian. <laughs> which could fit with an ectodermal dysplasia. So ectodermal dysplasia, kids will have absent hair, they'll have absent sweating, poor teeth. Absent sweating would be very, very problematic in London um, anytime now or 150 years ago. Um, 
and, and could be lethal. Um, it by itself would not make you small uh, or have a limp, but there's a number of patients that have been described with contiguous gene deletions on X chromosome. Um, uh, the, the most common ectodermal dysplasia gene is, is an X-linked <coughs> disease. Uh, if you have deletions of the genes uh, immediately upstream and downstream of it, those kids will often have small stature and some intellectual disability too. This I have to say though, you know, the frog, it would be much more common to have salmonella osteomyelitis. Fair enough. <laughs> Not my air expertise. Thanks with the turtles. Yeah. Uh, Seckel syndrome also. Those kids have big noses, tiny heads, they're puny. Um, good fit. So just thinking out loud about possibilities of, from a genetic dysmorphology standpoint, Think, got to think skeletal dysplasias or, or genetic bone diseases first, things like osteogenesis and perfecta. If you truly did have a congenital scoliosis, then Robinow syndrome would be a reasonably good fit. In terms of chromosomal disorders, maybe Down syndrome, I think that they'll kind of look Downs-like. Uh, Williams syndrome, I think, is a good fit. Uh, 1P36 deletion based on the one cartoon. Um, there's a lot of disorders with short stature, but some of these pictures at least raise the possibilities of Russell-Silver syndrome or Seckel syndrome for me and then teratogenic effects, uh, like fetal alcohol syndrome. Thank you very much. And finally, we have Dr. Scafidi, who's going to talk, talk to us about the neurologist's perspective of Tiny Tim. Hi, thank you. So from my perspective, as a neurologist, looking at the book and going through some of the pages, at least in my version, um, some of the things that I wanted to point out is that the family history, it suggests that he's the only one that's affected. As far as his general exam, um, definitely short stature, a proportionally small head is what I understood. Um, he did not appear dysmorphic, um, but Google might say otherwise. He was uh, weak, <laughs> preferred to be carried around, but he did run around the house, which was something that I had noted in the, uh, the actual book version that I have, uh, which I borrowed from my young daughter. So um, the other thing is that he has a crutch, which suggests some type of hemi or asymmetry between the two legs. But it does appear that both legs are affected. Um, of course, the, the version I looked at had uh, both leg braces on, iron braces, which was very common back then to try to fix some type of ailment or some type of spasticity. There's also no mention of lesions or tumorous growths on his skin, which is important for our differential diagnosis. Mentally, he is his speech is normal. He doesn't tire from speaking. He's very interactive. Um, there's no appear evidence of intellectual problems. Now, I do understand that he had a little bit of echolalia and a little bit of uh, perseverance, but it didn't appear to be out of the norm for his age. Uh, he seemed to be delightful. Uh, there's no mentions or suggestions of any type of asymmetry or problems with his cranial nerves. Now, regarding his motor, from what we know, the asymmetry, so both legs seem to be affected. One is requiring a crutch, a chronic problem that is worsening, and that's a question mark. Um, but he is, uh, according to the book, about to die within the next year if he doesn't receive treatment. He's hypotonic because his father needs to carry him, and that's important. Um, his withered hand suggests some type of muscle wasting. So if we put this kind of all together, we have this eight-year-old boy with progressive disease with potential for movement under better medical conditions. Um, his neurological exam is significant for this hypotonia, this progressive but fluctuating weakness, this muscle wasting, and evidence of skeletal muscle disease. <laughs> so if we kind of give a differential diagnosis but also break it up neurologically what we think, putting it up in the brain, the actual up here, unlikely, but birth injury, which was mentioned earlier, um, is a small possibility infection. Um, the asymmetry is a little bit of a red herring, um, but I do want to point out um, there's there was talk of saying that this isn't cerebral palsy because it's not progressive. However, if we think about it, the definition of progressive is something that's 
getting worse as time goes on. If we look at the original literature of cerebral palsy and the natural history of cerebral palsy, what we're defining as cerebral palsy nowadays, um, if you look back in the 1800s and early 1900s, some of the seminal work of this has actually been done and studied by Richmond Payne, who actually was a neurologist here at Children's National. And what he suggested was that there was a small group of children that had birth injury, and what ended up happening, they progressively got worse because they were just left to sit there. So the progressive worsening was actually their spasticity, which was getting worse and making it more difficult for them to breathe, to eat, to swallow. So I, I think if we put ourselves in that historical perspective, um, that is definitely a possibility. Now, the next level would be, as a neurologist, you would think, okay, could this be an upper motor neuron problem? Again, cerebral palsy. Um, uh, by the way, cerebral palsy was not called cerebral palsy years ago. It was called Little's disease. So just in case um, you might come across that in the literature. Uh, he could have had a transverse myelitis, which would fit with the uh, developing spasticity, worsening, and asymmetry, because you can see that because this is transverse myelitis that was untreated. He could have a compression of the cord. If you look at the lower motor neuron in his peripheral nerves, um, SMA, spinal muscular atrophy type two or three, very unlikely, but I just wanted to throw it out there. Polio is definitely a strong possibility. He could have had a Guillain-Barre syndrome, which basically is kind of progressively trying to heal itself, but he's left with this spasticity, which is getting worse and worse and can cause um, peril, especially at that uh, <laughs> time period. And a Charcot-Marie tooth would give you this asymmetry, this not able to walk properly, but the asymmetric pattern of uh, needing the crutch, um, still on the differential, but unlikely. Uh, neuromuscular junction, could he have had myasthenia gravis, progressive weakness? Uh, remember, we didn't know much or anything about that back in the 1840s, 1850s. And a myopathy, uh, which is a metabolic process. So um, definitely the top on my list would have been uh, some type of metabolic cause, which is progressively getting worse. As a neurologist, of course, many of the neurologists love to order MRIs. Um, actually, that would probably be bottom of my list. I would probably start out with just a regular chemistry panel, a red, uh, an infection panel. I would actually not LP him until I had more information about him because you worry if it is POTS disease or some type of tumor, could you be spreading it with the needle inside? So those are things. As far as myasthenia, you would just want to do a careful examination, no blood work. Uh, just basically have him look up, see if he tires easily. So those are the things. So I would actually just start out with a simple chemistry panel and look at his back uh, with x-rays. Well, thank you for a very interesting and informative discussion from our panelists. Dan, I have a Yes. <laughs> I see you've um, assembled a uh, wonderful array of uh, supreme medical uh -oh. Specialty. I see where this uh, is going. Consultants. Uh oh. Get your show. And I'm, I'm sad there are no. I don't see any other surgeons in the crowd. But uh, you know, from a surgeon's uh, perspective, and I'm embarrassed in front of all these uh, pediatricians, and I hate to be a Grinch or a, a Scrooge, but have we considered child abuse in the, this situation? You know, I think that no one wants to consider that. that Bob Cratchit would do such a thing to his child, or Miss Cratchit for that Precisely, matter. That but <laughs> you're right. Definitely always in a differential diagnosis, non accidental trauma or child abuse has to be in there. So thank you for bringing that important point up. Uh, I'll bring one other. The other possibility is malingering. If you'll notice in the, <laughs> if you'll notice in the photographs, every other one, the crutch is on a different side. Um, you know, it's a poor story. And, you know, when they talk about the empty crutch later on, that doesn't mean he died. It just may mean he's no longer going out and trying to beg for money because he's now too big and it no longer sells very well. Well, good childhood syndrome. Absolutely. <laughs>
So, you know, we, we may never know exactly what Tiny Tim had, but at this point, I'd like to invite Dr. Rachmanina forward. She's going to talk about a historical perspective of what the remedies for Tiny Tim might have been. <laughs> Definitely, uh, I think a very lively discussion, and I want you to travel with me to 1840. And as you know, the choice for me was very simple. Russians always talk about history, right? So one of the first the best steps that Scrooge, after he answered, I care, I share, campaigned. <laughs> <laughs> I think we could have saved Dickens all trouble by just getting him into this campaign. He would have probably donated some money to the cause of Tiny Tim. And the first good thing that they could have done for this boy is to take him out of the very filthy, dirty city. Remember, when Victorian era, there was a very big difference whether you were a poor child and worked on the factories frequently starting 5 a.m. until 9 p.m. with only 40 minutes break for lunch, not allowed to laugh and run with peers or even make a talk during your work because it distracts you to decrease your productivity. Or you were a wealthy child who went downtown London and had the wonderful toys brought to him. And obviously the financial status very much determined how your treatment would be cared. But one of the first things that you could do for the child from relatively poor family is to move him out of London, to move him to the countryside where he could have access to fresh air, sunlight, and a better food. In London at the time, the food was also of a very poor quality to the social media where Tiny Tim belonged. One thing I want to point out, Please notice, Tiny Tim wouldn't have had ever that much baggage with him. We are now traveling, complaining about $50 suitcase charge. At the time, everything that little boy would have with him would probably be his mother's shawl, in which he, she would have wrapped just a few, few extra pieces of clothes. Children usually wore one uh, outset of clothes throughout the certain age until they outgrew it, so there was no much change. So with, with much less uh, baggage, moving him out to the country to some relatives, or which was very common practice, then to pay to somebody to host him. And those of you who love and know Miserable, remember little, uh, uh, little girl was placed by her mother in the countryside to the family of Gazette, to the family of uh, people whom she paid and hoped for the better care. That care was never delivered, but that was also sometimes used to help children. So going from England to Netherlands, Max, Anton Pick, one of my favorite painters of the uh, Dutch, um, really shows what Tiny Tim would have enjoyed in the countryside, being outside, playing, spending time on the fresh air, being physically active, and clearly being exposed to the sun. <laughs> this is one of the very early pictures of how Ricketts was indeed treated. At the time, children were late for a certain amount of time. It usually was a, a cent clock. And I remember growing up in Russia in one of the hospitals, we still had the ward, which had the very open doors to the balcony. And the balcony had the set of beds like that. And the children had to lay down in the sunlight, which later on, with Marshall showing you the picture, was changed to the indoor treatment with the sun exposure. In London, indeed, air was so polluted that those of you who would look at the picture of London of Victorian era would see the buildings completely bad. In fact, they had to scrape the buildings because there was so much coal burning. So fresh air and sun. The next thing would be good food. And one could hope that with the support of Scrooge, we now have access to better food. So much needed milk. Meat quality in London in the 1840s was so bad. Do you know how majority of roast beef was eaten in London in the 1840s? People closed their noses because the meat smelled so bad. Meat was usually spoiled by the time it reached the shops, in particular in the poor area. And as you can see, a little wine was considered very beneficial to children. We have to rethink this 21 age limit. <laughs> because if you read that the school records, even Pushkin and Russian record and Lyceum, received every day a glass of port wine starting age of 12. So when the child was ill, to get him a little bit of wine, and this particular glass I found the picture has citrus in it, which is very important because it wasn't until Cook Expedition that British sailors started carrying very large amount of citrus on the boats to save them from scurvy. Uh, the typical pharmacy of this, I don't know what's happening with this slide, but I can't go there, but anyhow, the typical pharmacy of this time, I had a picture of the pharmacy, would have displayed, these are very common remedies which would have been prescribed by the physicians then. Beef, wine, and iron broth, so some kind of the uh, mixture to increase, particularly for the treatment of anemia uh, and, and straightening of the child. All kind of phosphorylacetin combinations, nerve food, you can see, and tonic. Tonics were very popular 
for improving the health. And then uh, tasteless, as you can see, the extract of cod liver oil was very popular uh, to treat uh, rickets at the time. Please notice how much, and I know Marshall mentioned how much of opium was used in the treatment of children, and indeed very high concentration of the alcohol. This is a treatment for asthma. Please notice for children, 45% alcohol, opium. And this is, I specifically like this picture, this is for newborns, neonates, and if you can look here closely, it is 46% alcohol, one and uh, ninth grade of opium, and it is to five days old infant already providing five drops, moving to two weeks, eight drops, then five years, and then adults moving on to one teaspoon. So a very common remedy at the time. Yeah. One picture that I really like is that one. It's Queen Victoria, and the uh, advertisement on the jar, on the bottle of the medicine specifically says, this is her very specific advice to give to children. Tincture, a mixture of uh, alcohol-based mixtures of different elements, extremely common for the treatment of all kinds of conditions and they continue to uh, frequently contain a very high proportion of belladonna, opium, sodium bicarbonate, sodium citrate. We didn't talk that much about renal tubular acidosis, but in fact there are two medical publications on tiny team disease, and that's where the authors seem to believe the cause of his condition was that definitely would be partial uh, treatment for that condition. One important thing, please do read here, it's small print, and I don't want it to read, but Ricketts is mentioned. But what's remarkable on the majority of these labels, what is always being said, it helps the child, but it also helps the mother. <laughs> and multiple conditions are listed. Anything from rickets to measles. And this is also typical of all remedies. When you read the list of what it cures, it cures almost everything possible known to the physicians at the time. It gave them a great flexibility in choosing the same treatment for very different conditions. If um, Scourge was very generous, <laughs> and gave Tiny Tim a lot of support. Tiny Tim probably could have emerged in one of the treatments that involved a lot of expense at the time. Uh, it's mineral water baths uh, for well stay, obviously. In England, there was only one place, very famous, Somerset Bath, but in Europe, those of you who visited Baden Baden, Carlo Vivari, very French resorts, where people stood in water for a very prolonged period of time. Water frequently contained high levels of phosphate and other microelements. They drank the water at the same time, and usually at these locations, the food was provided of a better quality. So a visit to such kind of uh, place would have definitely be considered among one of the most efficient but more expensive treatments. And in fact, the first royal hospital of mineral waters still stands in Somerset, England, where it was official treatment program using mineral waters. And then, as we all talked about throughout the program today, is using the spleen, and I just thought I'd share with you the picture, typical picture of the air spleen that the child of his age would be using. So you can see not that many remedies, but that probably would be the array of the things that would have been tried for Tim in 1840 England. Thank you very much. We actually have a word from our patient to close things out. Very this one right there. <laughs> this works. You believe what you want to believe. <laughs> it's quite nice. Well, thank you. They're not too They're not toast, my love, my dear. Oh, you are Merry Christmas. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. So God bless us, everyone, is what Tiny Tim says. Happy holidays. Thank you very much. Yes, if you have questions for the panelists, please come forward. Thank you. I'm telling you, I like the author of this gift. Yeah, I'm telling you, I think his mom was a better grandma. Excellent job. Yeah. Thank you. That's fun. Wonderful job. Very entertaining. Thank you very much. Thank you. That was fun. And no, we don't normally. And no, we don't normally have that. Oh, I made a bill of thousand dollars. Well done. <laughs> Thanks for using WebEx. Please visit our website at www.webex. Happy holidays.